Welcome everyone to the OSRL Swiss Water Column Monitoring Equipment Overview. My name is Mario Fazio and I'm the OSRL Swiss Manager for the APAC region based in Perth, Western Australia. So today I'm going to be joined by Dr Jody Harney from CSA Ocean Sciences and Jody's going to take us through the water column monitoring equipment, the instrumentation and an overview um, on deployment. Um, so before we get too far into it, uh, I'll hand over to Jody and Jody, if you could talk a little bit about yourself and CSA, that would be much appreciated. Welcome. Thank you, Mario, and good morning to everyone in the Asia Pacific region. It's evening here in Florida where I am based. My name is Jody Harney. I'm a senior scientist at CSA Ocean Sciences, and I'm here tonight to talk to you about the water column monitoring services and equipment that CSA provides to OSRL and the Swiss members. CSA is a marine environmental consulting firm, and in the years following the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in 2010, we help the industry figure out uh, shared programs for deep water water column monitoring in the event of an oil spill, specifically spills in which subsea dispersants are a potential um, tactic for response. I've also invited a colleague of mine, Kathleen Gifford. You'll see her in a couple of videos later this evening, and we'll be happy to answer questions at the end um, for any um, additional information you might need about the, the equipment or the uh, your region in particular. Thanks, Thanks Jody. Mario. Thank you, Jody. And um, look forward to seeing um, some of those videos with Kathleen in in the featuring as the as the main event, the star. So um, <laughs> today we're going to have a look at um, a few areas, but particularly uh, we're going to point out the global subsea response network um, that's available to the OSRL Swiss subscribers, and, and I'll talk a little bit about how that works. Jody will take us through the water column monitoring equipment, which is the main feature of this webinar. Um, she'll take us through the background and purpose. We'll have a look at monitoring during subsea dispersant use um, and take a deeper dive into the equipment and instrumentation. And some of the videos that uh, Kathleen's in um, sort of really point out some of the equipment that's uh, available on the uh, water column monitoring system. We'll then go into the mobilization and deployment and then at the end, um, we'll have a, uh, a brief Q&A. Um, through the Global Subsidy Response Network on, and through OSRL, we've set up um, these agreements where uh, subscribers to the subsea well intervention services can access different network partners. And the reason is that we know that to undertake a successful uh, well control or loss of well control response, um, it takes more than one company to provide a, um, the total solution. So not one company alone can, can, can do this. So through the Global Subsea Response Network, through our system partners, we've um, allowed for um, members to access specialist services and, and personnel um, through framework agreements. So how it works is, uh, OSRL will have these framework agreements sitting in the background. If the well owner or the incident owner requests OSRL to access a specialist service, such as CSA, for example, in a loss of well control event, um, our CRO will facilitate access to that particular global subsea response network partner through the framework agreement. And it's important to note that our CRO are not a contract party to those agreements. Uh, we just facilitate the process for you to access um, that, those specialist services and personnel. Um, if you have existing agreements with the subsea well or the global subsea response network partners, that's fine. You can use those existing agreements. This is just giving you another uh, avenue to access those those uh, resources. So if we talk about the water column monitoring equipment in particular, uh, it's included in the uh, OSRL Swiss capping supplementary agreement. There's a few services agreed and um, included in the uh, capping supplementary agreement. Water column monitoring is one of those uh, services. So to access the CSA specialists um, and response personnel, we would utilize those global subsea response network agreements, those framework agreements that we talked about, unless you already had an existing agreement with CSA. But that's how you would access the personnel. So the equipment is through the uh, supplementary agreement and the personnel are through the, uh, the framework agreements. So this is just a, an overview of our current global subsea response network partners. Uh, there's 12 there at the moment. Uh, we're adding to those as we speak. Um, We've talked about that in previous webinars, so there's a couple of others that are coming on board, um, but you can see they range um, from different um, 
capabilities and ex experience and expertise, I suppose, for the relevant areas to deal with a loss of uh, loss of well control type event or incident. So we're going to get into the water column monitoring. So I'm going to hand over to Jody now, and, and Jody's going to take us through the specifics of the equipment and uh, the instrumentation. So um, thanks, Jody. I'll hand over to you, and you can take them through the next piece. All right. Thank you so much, Mario. As I mentioned, um, following the Deepwater Horizon spill in the U.S. Gulf of Mexico in 2010, the offshore industry realized that to be able to have offshore deepwater equipment on standby for, for monitoring in the event of, of an oil spill or a deepwater blowout, they really needed a shared set of equipment that could be a turnkey solution, and that would include both scientific and operational monitoring. The industry explained their needs, which was to have it containerized for rapid mobilization, so we weren't trying to bring pieces together at the last minute. It needed to be customized for deep water, maintained to industry standards, and capable, importantly, of supporting a request to use subsea dispersant as a response tactic. At the time, in around 2013, BP and their industry partners issued a request for proposal to develop the program and it involved the, the development, the design development and build of two identical kits, one for US Gulf of Mexico member operators who were members of the consortium Marine Well Containment Company, and one for BP's um, international use for their um, well control needs. And when we bid on that project, CSA Ocean Sciences, we were selected as the contractor and we built the kits um, that were completely identical in every way in all of their inventories, except for the color. So you see here, the top kit used to belong to BP and they've since shared that asset with OSRL and the bottom kit uh, is colored yellow and that, that is still in operation at MWCC. So CSA executed that contract, designed and delivered that equipment and still continues to maintain those equipment um, programs in, for the industry. OSRL's equipment is based in Houston at the Trend Center facility, and MWCC's equipment is based in Theodore, Alabama. My colleague Kathleen, who I've invited here tonight, helps me with the um, on-site maintenance and care of the equipment and instruments, and she's also, in some videos later on, they'll give you a tour both inside the containers and of some of the equipment. The uh, the program consists of two standard 8x20 work vans, one we refer to as a laboratory van and one as an operations van. They're designed to work together and be powered by a single 480 volt power source from the vessel. They are also, um, they have an integrated ship's alarm and they're designed for uh, safety for workers to be inside the containers during the um, onshore phase and when they're deployed offshore. Next slide, please. The equipment is maintained on standby in secure locations, powered 24 seven and air conditioned or climate controlled. The containers are certified by DNB and the American Bureau of Shipping, and we maintain those certifications on behalf of the equipment owners. And they serve as the work vans both during regular maintenance when they're onshore and in the event that they would be deployed offshore. Everything in the containers was new upon purchase, commercial grade and industry standard. And the um, equipment is also accompanied by an electromechanical cable that's customized for the equipment that's on board. So we have a way to power and communicate with all of the instruments incorporated into the equipment program. There are also redundant systems to minimize downtime, so there's at least two of everything, including all the sensors and uh, plenty of spares. There's also consumables and supplies to last for a potential two-week deployment before needing resupply. Importantly, the equipment program consists of a launch recovery system that enables the equipment to be uh, lowered over the side of the vessel and communicated with and powered. So we don't have to worry about looking for the proper A-frame and winch and custom cable to be able to launch, recover, and communicate with the equipment. 
the A-frame and the skid um, for the OSRL program was um, certified by DNV post construction, and that DNV certification is maintained. Oh, this means we have a movie. So this is the first time you'll get a chance to um, take a look at Kathleen, my colleague, and she'll walk you through a brief video and tell you a little bit more about the Lars. Hi, my name is Kathleen Gipper with CSA Ocean Sciences. We're here at the uh, Trend Center facility in Houston, Texas, and this is the water column monitoring kit. We have the monster recovery system, the Lars with a winch and uh, a frame which we'll put into the water this rosette here with the CTD on the bottom of the rosette. Uh, we have two containers part of this kit, uh, the operations container and then the laboratory container. The laboratory container houses the stainless steel uh, workbenches as well as laboratory PPE and um, monitoring equipment for air quality as well as presence absence of hydrocarbons and water samples. In here we also have the refrigerators to keep our samples when collected preserved um, before shipment. And we have a fume hood in here for um, health and safety when handling uh, chemicals. As you can see we also have an eye wash station, AED, and fire extinguisher with emergency exit. operations container. In here we have our sub-80 freezer plus workbenches with tools, whatever we need uh, to maintain the equipment. Uh, at the far end of the container you'll have the computers that will run the equipment software, as well as communication up to the bridge and out to the deck with personnel. So this is the Lars. Um, it has a 25 horsepower winch that has a 3,500 meter cable, coax cable on it, um, but it can only go down to 3,000 water uh, depth for sampling. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, I hope that walkthrough was helpful to try and tie some of the equipment and terms we use together. Majority of the objective that we were trying to meet in designing and building the equipment, uh, water column monitoring equipment programs, was to be able to uh, use the equipment for monitoring during subsea dispersants um, use or subsea dispersant injection at the wellhead in the event of a blowout. You all are probably very familiar with subsea dispersants and how they're um, designed to be used, but I'll just go through this briefly. This is a great figure from an IPCA IOGP document in 2015, and it helps to illustrate the um, intended uh, effect of using subsea dispersants. So you see at the wellhead or at the source of the blowout, out dispersant is injected at the source causing a reduction in um, particle size and um, the droplets are then less buoyant and it impedes rise to the surface, which causes a, um, the, the oil droplets to stay in the subsea water column. Some um, droplets obviously have larger mean diameter will still make it to the surface and thus we have a need for monitoring in situ in the water column from close to the seafloor up to the sea surface. The equipment and the approach to this is designed um, based on what was learned from Deepwater Horizon and is primarily based on uh, publications from the United States by the American Petroleum Institute and the um, regional response team. And effectively, these describe phases for monitoring of the use of subsea dispersants. There are three principal phases. First is confirming dispersant effectiveness near the discharge point and also at the sea surface, expecting to see a decrease in volatile organic compounds. So you'd be looking for visual information at the wellhead, as well as measuring the um, air quality at the sea surface. Secondly, you wanna look into the water column at depth and try and characterize what the dispersed oil looks like in um, the water depths between the sea surface and the sea floor. 
And third, you'd want to be able to chemically characterize water samples, both on board the vessel for screening, as well as detailed chemical analysis at an onshore laboratory. The methods for doing this include in-situ detection of hydrocarbons in the water column. We want to know in real time using signals uh, whether or not we can see uh, substances that are potentially hydrocarbon. And secondly, in-situ characterization of other water column properties. So we'd want to be able to measure temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen, and, and other uh, properties. And third, we want to be able to collect water samples at depth to be able to send them to the laboratory for analysis. The capabilities of the equipment that we've been showing you are principally to provide real-time in-situ water column characterization. So that is, once the instruments are deployed over the side of the vessel, they can be sent to the seafloor and scientists on board the vessel can view the properties in real time and be able to collect samples. The instruments include a conductivity, temperature, and depth sensor, or CTD. These are designed to measure salinity and temperature with depth. A dissolved oxygen sensor that measures the in-situ concentration of dissolved oxygen in seawater. Fluorometers that can detect organic molecules by measuring their fluorescence properties. Turbidity sensors to measure the turbidity or the, the degree of the, to which the water loses its transparency due to suspended particles and a list, a laser in situ scanning and transmissometry instrument that's designed to measure the uh, diameter or mean diameter particle size of suspended um, droplets in the water column. Importantly, we're also able to collect water samples in, um, at any depth using this system. The bottles that you see here on the rosette to the left can be triggered at any depth remotely by scientists in the um, work bands on the uh, deck of the vessel. And then those uh, sampling bottles are closed at depth, retrieved to the vessel. The water is extracted from them and can be analyzed on board the ship, as well as sent to laboratories on shore for analysis. On board the ship, there are ways of um, screening these uh, water samples. Principally, the there is a mobile mass spectrometer on board which can be used to examine hydrocarbon components that are volatilized from the headspace over a water sample. And while that mobile mass spectrometer doesn't give you detailed fingerprinting or um, other chemical fingerprint or characteristics or concentrations, it does help our scientists identify the presence and absence of those volatile compounds in seawater. This is an example of a water column profile that we would we would produce from by um, deploying these instruments. This is an actual plot from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill where there was a subsea plume that was um, tracked and characterized in the weeks following the spill. So what you see in this plot is water depth on the y-axis from zero at the sea surface down to close to 1600 at the seafloor. And you see on the x-axis, four different properties are displayed. On the top, we have turbidity, and then CDOM, which is a measure of fluorescence, in green, dissolved oxygen, and at the bottom, another measure of fluorescence. So if you take a look at these curves, the first one here in blue is the fluorescence signal from the um, eco CDOM, which stands for colored dissolved organic matter. And essentially, you get some, in, some high values in the surface waters owing to phytoplankton and other organic material. And then as you, uh, descend through the water column, essentially your, your organic material decreases and becomes constant. Around this 1100 to 1200 meter water depth, we see an increase in the CDOM fluorescence above background. And this is a potential indication that this is organic material, likely hydrocarbons that are in the submerged water column. So at this point, you would collect a sample expecting that to um, potentially contain hydrocarbons. And this is the way that that subsea plume was tracked um, in the weeks following the spill. The green plot you see here starts at the sea surface where dissolved oxygen is um, over six and a half milligrams per liter and then decreases in the what's known as the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, not caused by the oil spill, but due to the consumption of nutrients in the midwater column. Then the dissolved oxygen increases steadily as um, the instruments go down through the water column 
until you see at that same depth between 1100 and 1200 meters, a relative decrease in the dissolved oxygen concentration compared to background. And this was an indication, as you all probably remember, that the um, uh, microorganisms organisms were consuming the submerged oil plume and causing a relative decrease in the surrounding oxygen levels in the water column. And then the oxygen begins to increase again toward the seafloor. There's a second measure of, of, um, of fluorescence in the, the reddish purple here where there's a peak in the, in the surface. This is detecting phytoplankton in the upper water column. It's tuned for a slightly different fluorescent signal and serves as a background. You don't see a signal in the deep water column here in that second form of fluorescence. And then finally, the far plot is uh, one of turbidity, which will give you an indication of the transparency of the water column relative to the background. So it was a combination of these signals that helped scientists decide where to collect water samples for uh, laboratory analysis. And it was primarily these two signals in CDOM and in dissolved oxygen that uh, led to the characterization of the, the water column during that incident. Kathleen showed you the rosette and the water sampling bottles. This is the um, also the frame that holds all of the uh, instrumentation and is connected by the electromechanical cable to the launch and recovery system. We use uh, Seabird Electronics, all full ocean depth deep water systems. These are standard in the oceanographic community and uh, really the workhorses in terms of um, deep water monitoring, but they're difficult to get. We uh, own a lot of this equipment, but it's typically out in the world working and it has pretty strict requirements for maintenance needs to be returned to a manufacturer each year. So you really want um, someone responsible for taking care of this equipment, even when it's on standby and being able to be uh, immediately deployed without having to worry about whether it's in proper calibration or if it's been cared for you know, appropriately while it's been in, in storage. The rosette also holds Teflon line GoFlow water sampling bottles. This enables us to collect water samples in real time from any depth. And finally, there's a backup sensor or instrument that we call the auto fire module. In case you're not able to collect samples in real time, this auto fire module will let you uh, program it to collect a sample at a particular depth. But really the strength of it is in the in-situ capability for seeing what's, what the characteristics of the water column are and being able to collect water samples at the depths you intend based on those signals. The CTD is um, not only measuring conductivity, temperature, and depth in the water column, it also serves as essentially the brain of the entire package. It's mounted to the rosette and it has numerous other sensors integrated into it, including pressure sensor, a pump that drives the um, ability for the dissolved oxygen sensor to detect the in situ concentrations, an altimeter, the CDOM fluorometer, and the second fluorometer, which also has a combined turbidity sensor. It's important that these instruments are maintained year round, even though they're not being used in the field. So that's where Kathleen and her team come in to um, maintain the instruments um, three times a year while they're on standby. The list is a laser in situ scanning and transmissometry device. It measures in situ particle size distribution using laser diffraction as, a, as its principle. There are two types of lists, one the list 100, which is um, designed to go to 300 meters water depth, or it can be used as a bench instrument to examine water samples, and a list deep. The list deep, were they weren't readily available um, in the, in the, at the time of the deep water horizon but have become uh, much more commercially available. They're still difficult to get off the shelf. So there are two of these deep systems integrated into the um, OSRL water column monitoring kit. And these can be um, deployed either um, in association with the rosette or on an ROV uh, near source control and can be deployed in up to 3000 meters water depth. Importantly, this is not a real-time instrument. It has to be programmed and retrieved in order to process the data, but it does um, provide the ability to monitor 
particle size um, at depth. The uh, HAPSITE is a portable gas chromatograph and mass spectrometer. This is primarily used in the um, military to examine um, air quality, but it can also be used to examine the volatilized components that come out of a water sample when it's heated to high temperature. So we use this on the bench top inside the laboratory container to examine the um, if there's any content, any hydrocarbon content in the water samples. So essentially we use this as a screening tool. While we can identify some volatilized components, it's important that we can't necessarily provide quantitative fingerprinting information, which just helps us with screening and presence absence to prioritize uh, which samples should be analyzed at a laboratory. We do have some um, curves that we've designed in-house to be able to compare the content of a vol volatilized sample to some standard curves. So we are able to identify individual components um, that would help us to confirm the hypothesis that there's oil in that sample. There are um, portable air monitoring devices for measuring VOCs and benzene. This is primarily for worker health and safety. You don't have to be an industrial hygienist to use these tools. So we have um, folks on our team who have been trained to use these. There are um, three of each type so that multiple units can be used at one time on a single vessel. And uh, they're designed to not only monitor VOCs and benzene for worker health and safety, but it's part of the subsea dispersant monitoring protocol to test the hypothesis that um, the air quality near source control will improve if the oil is impeded from coming to the surface. So they also have a role in the monitoring as well as um, health and safety. Speaking of worker health and safety, there are a number of features inside the containers that help to um, ensure worker health and safety. The air monitoring devices that I just talked about, plus um, offshore smoke and heat detectors, integrated horn and strobe alarms, um, integration with the ship's marine and general alarms. There are oxygen sensors and associated alarms, communication systems that enable communication with the bridge as well as on deck, uh, fire extinguishers, uh, standard spill kits, first aid equipment, and some personal protective equipment. This is um, pretty standard in the offshore industry that most folks will bring their own PPE, but there are flotation devices, hard hats, eye and ear protection, uh, safety harnesses, gloves, and other first aid equipment on board. There are also video cameras that we can mount to the external um, surfaces of the containers so that we're able to monitor deck activity around the containers while they're deployed offshore. And another movie starring Kathleen. This is the Rosette water sampler. It is 12 positions, so it can hold 12 GoFlow bottles. And right now we have five liter GoFlows attached to it. At the bottom of the rosette will be the CTD, and the CTD analyzes conductivity, temperature, dissolved oxygen, uh, color dissolved organic matter, uh, chlorophyll A, turbidity throughout the water column. Um, the bottles will go into the water closed as it is right now. Um, when it hits about 10 meters or so, this pressure sensor will depress, opening up the bottle. And then once you hit the depth that you want to see or you see something that you want to sample in real time through the software, you can send a signal to the rosette to close it. And you'll then have your water sample uh, in place at that depth. Once on board, you just dispense the water through this valve. And you can then send it to the laboratory for analysis of hydrocarbons, nutrients, whatever the project needs. Currently we have set up the List 100X. Um, for this kit, it would be a bench top analyzer for particle size, um, but it can also go in the water up to 300 meters. Uh, we do have a List Deep that can go up to 3,000 meters and it would be attached to the rosette. So like I said, they analyze particles such as oil droplets to see the effectiveness of subsea dispersants. This is the Inficon Half Site ER. It's a field durable gas chromatograph mass spectrometer, so GCMS. 
Inside you have your uh, concentrator that the ions adhere to, a neg pump that gets up to 400 degrees Celsius, and behind this you have other pumps such as the ion pump. Um, your calibration gases will go in here, you have nitrogen and your internal standard. For the use of the water column monitoring kit, we have a headspace here and this will sample the headspace of water samples for VOCs or hydrocarbons. So you put your unknown sample into here and you let it warm up in your headspace and then when it's time you pull up on your sampling needle and you place it into your sample and you run your tests. And then as your test is running the half site is wirelessly connected to the tough book and you can see your chromatograph begin to form on the screen. And these different peaks show different ions falling out of retention from the sample. This right here is an auto ray housing uh, multi-rays. Um, and the auto ray is just used to calibrate the multi-rays. The multi-rays will be used on the back deck of a vessel during working hours to monitor um, the air quality for worker safety. And it has several sensors inside, an oxygen sensor, a carbon monoxide sensor, a volatile organic compound sensor, hydrogen sulfide, and lower explosion limit. And these will be maintained throughout the life of the project. And if they reach uh, dangerous levels, then alarms will sound and lights will go off so workers will know to immediately get inside the vessel and the vessel out of the area. Great, thank you again, Kathleen. I hope you're getting a feel of what this instrumentation is designed to do and, and how it works. Um, once the samples are collected at depth, either based on the water column profile indicators or at specific depths that are targeted, the uh, water samples can be extracted from the GoFlow bottles and either analyzed on board, as Kathleen was describing, using the GCMS, to get an understanding of what, if any, volatile components might be present in that water sample. And then those samples are also handled on board and maintained under chain of custody until they can be transferred to an onshore laboratory for detailed chemical analysis and concentrations of um, TPH, PAH, VOCs, and other um, detailed fingerprinting. Mario, do you want to cover this topic for us. Yeah, thanks, thanks Jody, and uh, thanks Kathleen as well. Great videos, uh, uh, they're um, really, really awesome to show the equipment and um, you know, in the in the containers. So I really appreciate that. So I'm going to take you through uh, a, a small segment on um, activation of the equipment. So, um, and I'll talk about this in general terms. So yeah, um, so. Through the activation of the OSRL Swiss equipment, and we include the water column monitoring in this, so for under the capping agreement, the member would just contact OSRL um, through the, the duty number that's listed on uh, the website, uh, which takes you through to the Southampton or Singapore main office branches. Um, the duty manager will then respond to your call within 10 minutes, 24 seven, uh, and act as your primary uh, point of contact for, um, for the duration. Um, and then, uh, if you request the, the Swiss equipment, um, the RSRL duty manager undertakes a verification of your subscription. So it looks at, you know, what you're subscribed to um, and then looks at um, the, the uh, location and um, then starts the process of um, sending you the forms that need to be completed. So, right. So the forms um, is once you make that initial call, there's a notification form um, that's available on the RSRL website or the duty manager will issue that. Um, form to you by email and, and then we really need to understand what you need so from a subsea well response uh, perspective so we need this the uh, subsea well response equipment identification and configuration form and that's going to be issued to you by the duty manager so what do you need uh, and and, uh, and and the configuration for example the capping stack etc and you would ask for the water column monitoring equipment specifically in that uh, which is under the terms of the capping agreement as I said uh, and then there's always the indemnity form. So the Swiss deployment indemnity form needs to be uh, issued and then signed and returned. Once all those forms are uh, returned, then the equipment um, begins to get mobilized. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, as we go on. So um, this slide, um, you'll see sort of 
sort of heading towards the center of the slide there, there's a red line uh, in the middle of those boxes. We, we um, will talk about the, um, the areas of responsibility with regard to that red line. So uh, if we take the water column monitoring equipment, for example, um, you know, CSA's role with, is in maintaining the equipment and making sure it's ready to be deployed at any one time. Um, so um, once you press the button and um, all the forms obviously have been issued and signed and approved, uh, then we go to mobilise. So, what, um, so um, CSA would then undertake the preparation for that mobilisation. Uh, and then uh, we would then get it from um, the uh, um, location where it's being maintained and held uh, at the Trend Centre facility in, in Houston over to the airport. We would then mobilise it to the airport via trucks. So it'd be loaded onto trucks, mobilised to the airport. Um, and that's where the handover occurs between uh, OSRL, CSA, for example, um, to the well owner or the incident owner, and that's called the transfer of custody. And, and then from there, the well owner is responsible to ensure that the, um, the aircraft has been chartered, um, the correct aircraft, and we'll talk about that in a moment uh, for this equipment. Um, and then the transport of logistics at the um, disembarkation end. So when it gets to its destination, uh, it needs to be unloaded, uh, put onto trucks at the airport, and then needs to be conveyed to the, to the, uh, the, the relevant port. Um, and that's where the vessel charter comes in. So the well owner needs to charter the, the, uh, the correct vessel for this equipment to undertake the work. Uh, and then um, the mobilisation, that's where we would then, you know, the well owner could utilise the uh, CSA people, personnel, and we'll talk about that in a moment, to actually undertake the mobilisation in the field and undertake the work. So you can see this distinct pieces of um, responsibility, I suppose, uh, and work that need to occur uh, from a logistics sense. Um, in that whole uh, response frame. And that's just one piece of equipment. And we're talking about the water column monitoring, obviously. So, um, uh, and if you've got any questions on that, please feel free to uh, post them up on the Q&A, or you can ask me later as well via, um, via, our, via our website or my email. Once the call out process has occurred, according to the way Mario has described it, CSA supports the mobilization and deployment of the water column monitoring equipment. So we would deploy folks to the Trendsetter facility in Houston, assist with bringing down the power and preparing the equipment for shipment. OSRL would take it to the airport and it would um, eventually reach its destination in country. We would also provide folks to help with mobilization of the equipment on the vessel, plans and um, other needs for personnel, both onshore and offshore and if needed, um, providing data to serve your in-house common operating picture. Okay, I'll, I'll take over. If you want okay, to. thanks, Mario. <laughs> thanks. Um, so this, this slide here um, is our response time model for uh, mobilization. So we talked about that, um, you know, left of the red line and right of the red line and who's doing what from a responsibility point of view. And this is a timeline of how that sort of comes together. So the history on this, um, I, working with the Swiss subscribers here in Australia, we developed a response time model, um, which is also now available to the, um, to the to the APA Drilling Industry Steering Committee Working Group uh, members as well. But part of that response time model was the water column monitoring equipment. So we we included it in the, in the RTM. Uh, we used a, uh, a base case of uh, northwest of Australia as its destination. Um, so a lot of the uh, information that's based in that response time model uh, is for that base case northwest of Australia. So if you have a look at this slide here, we talk about the notification. So that's the notification from the well owner or the incident owner um, through to OSRL, then over to CSA. So we would notify CSA and activate CSA once all those um, forms have been signed, obviously. Uh, and then we need to get the aircraft. Now it's important to note that um, the aircraft is the incident owner's responsibility to um, charter. Now, you can't just put this equipment on any plane. Uh, obviously, it needs to be an air cargo type plane uh, or aircraft, I should say. And um, you, you really can only put this into an Illusion 76 or an Antonov 124. Uh, it does not fit in a Boeing 747 freighter. The containers are uh, around about the um, 100 millimetres, just too big to fit into the Boeing 747 freighter doors, so it doesn't fit on a freighter. So it limits you to the amount of aircraft that you can choose from. Um, we have done some aircraft studies with that response time model that I talked about for Australia. Um, so 
the Illusion 76 uh, is what this is based on. But if there's an Antonov 124 that's available, and then you would then you would go for that. Obviously, in a uh, complete response, there's lots of aircraft movements to respond. Um, the subsea equipment as well as surface equipment to a loss of well control event. So aircraft um, availability will be tight, but there are plenty of aircraft around. It's just securing them. So we worked on um, uh, the, the average here is a three day airframe repositioning time, um, getting it into Houston. And then we've got the customs clearances, etc. cetera, um, equipment preparation, um, as we talked about earlier, and then loading it onto the aircraft at, at Houston. And uh, here we, as I said, we've got um, this aircraft coming into Caratha uh, in the northwest of Australia. Um, and then equipment being unloaded. So essentially by about day seven, you would have this equipment sea fastened onto a vessel and then transported out um, into the field, into the to, towards the the uh, the well uh, or the incident. So uh, we're looking at around seven days for this equipment. There are a number of duty positions offshore that um, need to be filled. So the way we've designed this is to show the basic role that the person would play, their responsibilities, and uh, how many are needed for 12 and 24 hour operations. And what's important to note here is that at the bottom of the chart, we have up to 12 for 12 hour and up to 18 people for the 24 hour. So some of these positions can be filled by one person serving multiple roles. Some of these positions may be filled by the incident owner or other in-country contractors. So some of this is um, designed to fit into your existing plans. Some of the key roles for um, personnel that CSA would provide would be scientists that can operate the equipment and operations specialists that help with its um, oversight deployment and programming. So those key operations and uh, scientific folks CSA would provide in sufficient numbers to serve either the 12 or 24 hour operations. So people like Kathleen and myself would be available to your teams um, to do the analysis offshore, to conduct the sampling. We can also help you with planning, um, help with identifying laboratories or identifying the appropriate tests. Some operators have really detailed plans and have all this worked out and would be able to fill some of these roles. Others uh, would need more support from personnel. So it's designed to be uh, rather fit for purpose. There are also some positions that may not necessarily be needed offshore. We certainly need lab technicians and folks to handle samples on board, but we may or may not need a GIS analyst on board just depending on um, the nature of how the data are reported and communicated to the command center. In most cases, protected species observers are going to um, need to be provided. And those folks um, make note, they're trained to identify and uh, capture data on protected species like marine mammals, sea turtles, birds, and often other human activity. So those folks would be um, sourced locally. We can help with that, or you may have um, your own means. And of course, safety officer position or an onboard medic, those are um, positions that could be filled locally or by the incident owner. Um, thanks for the uh, for that insightful presentation from uh, yourself and, and uh, those videos with Kathleen. I really appreciate that. Um, we're gonna go into our Q&A um, and we've got about a few minutes left, so we'll We'll answer a couple of questions for you. And then, um, as I said to you before, um, this event will be available, um, or this recording of this event will be available on the OSRL website um, later on next week. And um, uh, any questions that we don't get to, well, um, we'll post them on there. We'll post the questions on the website anyway for your, for your benefit. So, um, Jody, the first question that's come up is, can CSA, support operators in developing monitoring plans and uh, how can we engage CSA to undertake this type of work? So um, I might be able to answer part of that, but we'll, we'll let you go first. So, uh, Yes, so we uh, typically can help with uh, monitoring plans or uh, plans designed to get subsea dispersant use approved. Sometimes um, the approval process uh, takes many days, so some of the plans can be prepared from templates in advance. 
and then developed in the event of an exercise or an incident. So we can certainly help with that. There are some um, good references in the United States and I'm, I'm sure CSIRO and your own local um, uh, regulator have provided guidance for scientific and operational monitoring. So we could work collaboratively with you to customize something that would be most useful for um, the Asia Pacific region. And Mario, did you want to cover how that might they might have access to CSA if you don't already have a contractual arrangement with us? Yeah, yeah, I'll cover that off. Thanks, Jody. Yeah, so uh, in the event that you don't have an agreement um, with CSA uh, for a response, you would um, utilize those framework framework agreements. I spoke um, I spoke to earlier in our presentation, so that would be one way of doing it. Um, if you if you required um, preparedness work. Uh, for, for planning for your operational scientific monitoring plans, etc., then um, just contact me and we can um, uh, discuss how you would access uh, CSA services through um, OSRL to undertake preparedness work, um, um, you know, prior to an event, obviously. So um, that's probably the two ways that you can, can undertake that. So um, thanks, Jody. I'll go to our ne next question. Uh, it's around the vessel type. So what types of vessel will be required to deploy the equipment, sort of, I think that's alluding to size and um, type, I suppose. Um, yes, we have written a, a mobilization plan that describes some of this, this basic um, equipment, personnel and vessel requirements. The vessel requirement is designed to be more of a platform supply type vessel. We don't require an ROV. It doesn't um, necessarily have to be, um, a light construction vessel or have a helipad or anything like that. It, the vessel selection can be based on what the incident owner already has on contract, as long as it's of sufficient size for the, um, you know, mid ocean conditions. And that it it's often in working in source control may need to have dynamic positioning, but that would be something that the source control folks could tell us. So typically, a, a say 60 meter and up vessel with at least DP1 capabilities, platform supply vessel with a clear back deck. So we have room to install the um, the two containers as well as the launch and recovery system. Thanks, thanks Judy. And I, I could probably add to that a little bit. So through our um, global subsea response network and through the capping supplementary agreement, uh, members have access to the uh, Sea Response Vessel Tracking Software Platform. So um, that looks at the various capping missions, capping uh, water column monitoring, offset installation, etc., cetera, um, and then um, identifies the vessel types that are required for those specific missions and then locates those uh, within a, a geofenced area. If you, if, you, if you put them into a geofenced area, or locates them around a specific geographical area um, uh, live, so you can see real time what vessels are available um, to fit that specific mission need. So, as I said, that software is is um, comes with this uh, capping supplementary agreement along with the water column monitoring that we just talked about. So that's another way. So through our through our Clarkson's platform through our Maritech services. Um, the other the last question I have here for today is um, the response time model that was developed. Is that available? Um, to non-Swiss subscribers? Um, the short answer is uh, that response time model is a comprehensive model that was uh, originally undertaken for, for the Swiss subscribers. Um, however, um, through collaboration uh, in Australia, uh, OSRL have worked with the um, APR Drilling Industry Steering Committee uh, Source Control um, subgroup and have made that uh, response time model available to um, all of industry here in Australia. And that is available um, through the uh, through APR uh, or through myself if you if you want to have access to that response time model. And that sort of that's a model that is a guide um, uh, which can be utilized in your preparedness plans for um, capping. And uh, there's also another one for offset installation for those Swiss subscribers that utilize that equipment. So um, just let me know if you want to have access to that model. And that sort of brings us to a conclusion. We've got a few minutes left, but it brings us to um, to the end of our webinar today. Uh, as I said, um, if you need any further information, please um, reach me. If we go to the next slide, you'll see our contact details up there. Um, 
Jody uh, is also available if you have any questions to, um, to ask. And if you want to access CSA services, um, once again, speak to myself and um, we can we can arrange um, access to those services. So firstly, I'd like, or lastly, I'd like to thank you, Jody, for, um, yeah, I know it's sort of in the e early evening in Florida there, 9.30 nearly in Florida. Um, really appreciate that. Kathleen, appreciate you coming online as well from CSA um, and great videos, it's awesome. Um, so just like to say thanks to you both. Thank you so much, we appreciate your time. And um, yeah, if there's any other questions, like I said, sing, sing, uh, reach out to me and uh, through a uh, through either an email or through the website, and happy to help you. But that concludes our presentation. I thank you all for joining us today.